And look, I'm very excited about tonight. It's been the culmination of blood, sweat and tears for many of you. And we're going to have a celebration. I'm, I'm celebrating and I hope you will be joining with me in celebrating. So we'll formally kick off. Thank you for those who've come on time. It's just turned six o'clock here in Sydney. We'll wait a minute or two to, to ensure that all our friends, some of our family, and guests, mentors will be able to make it on, and then we will kick off the festivities. So sit tight. It's going to be a fun hour or so, and plus we have a wonderful keynote speaker in the form of Liesl Yearsley, who will be giving us some feedback, giving us some wise words of wisdom from a uh, really experienced perspective, a bunch of battle scars that you'll be able to share with us. As you can see, yes, look at this funnel, 450 leads, 360 people who attended events, 120 applications, 50 enrolled, 11 founders and nine startups. Pretty amazing. Awesome. This is the agenda for today. We'll have a brief welcome. And then we'll hear some experiences from our wonderful founders, and then we'll have a keynote from Liesl. Distinguished guests, mentors, friends, family, and of course, founders. On behalf of my fellow co-directors, the one, the only Paul Krzyzewski, Chris Clark, and Phoebe Zhang, and of course, our associates, Maz Zaman, Julian Luca, of course, Josh, Douglas, and Jet, I'd like to welcome you to today's event. I'm very excited about this graduation of the Founder Institute Australia New Zealand Spring 2020 group. As many of you know, the Founder Institute is the world's most proven network to turn ideas into fundable startups and startups into global businesses. Look at these stats to date. Founder Institute has helped launch over 6,000 companies across 200 cities, that's right, and six continents. Founder Institute was founded in 2009 by serial entrepreneur Adaya Resti and his good friend, Jonathan Greechen. And the idea for the, pro for the program spawned from operating the funder.com where it became apparent that for most entrepreneurs, while they were at this idea or launch stage, they lacked the structure, the feedback, and the support network needed to be successful. And you can see that the Founder Institute's vision <clears throat> is that there are talented people everywhere whose potential can be unlocked to make an impact on the world through entrepreneurship. And the mission is to empower talented and motivated people to build technology businesses positively impact the world, no matter of their location, race, gender, or sexual orientation. Tonight, we are celebrating the achievements of 11 founders who are graduating from the most recent core program. As you can see, what we've been through over the last four months, founders have validated their business idea and they've road tested their vision. They've made significant progress on their team. They've made significant progress on their product. They've also incorporated in a fashion that will make it easy for them to take on all sorts of investors. They've appointed formal business advisors. And they have also met clear milestones and actionable next steps. Tonight is the culmination of hard work from our founders have been supported by a wide range of experienced and motivated mentors, and some of them are on the call with us tonight. So we're really grateful for your support and thank you for giving your experiences and your time to the founders who are doing good things. Tonight is an opportunity for us to pause, to revel in what's been achieved and to get motivated for the many weeks and months ahead. And one of the people that has helped motivate us has been our sponsors for the program, Addison's. 
the law firm who have been great supporters of startups in our neck of the woods. In a moment, we'll be hearing from our founders. We'll then hear from Liz Yearsley, a serial founder who is now based in Sydney. Lisa has had and continues to build a fascinating career, starting originally with a medical degree in South Africa, to starting a tech company in Australia that listed on the ASX, creating a business that was acquired by IBM, and now running a business that's helping national disability insurance scheme their caregivers and support and health professionals. I've had the privilege of knowing Lisa for many years, and she is an inspiration and keen supporter of founders. Well, it's now time for us to hear from founders. Um, so I tonight, on behalf of um, all of the Australian and New Zealand Spring FI cohort, want to thank a range of people and also provide some reflections uh, for our graduates, including myself. Um, it was just on the 16th of August that we all commenced our FI journey with much excitement and trepidation, feeling that we all held the best unicorn idea. And we heard from previous founders that the journey we were about to embark on was going to be hard and there was going to be lots of waves to ride. And we all thought, oh, yeah, that's all fine and great. Um, but how hard can it be to really take um, an idea to an MVP in four months? Well, the answer is really hard, really, really hard. If, as you've just heard from Benjamin, there's a lot that we have done. Um, for those of you on the call tonight who don't know me, um, I'm Bev Jones. I'm the founder of Benavibe, and I'm proud to virtually be standing or sitting um, here with my fellow graduates. Um, and I, um, both Paul and Benjamin know how lucky I am to actually be here. I was issued with my first epic sprint in week two or three. And I pivoted multiple times until I was dizzy, um, but more on that later. Um, and I'm still here today, so I'm very grateful. The FI program has seen us all test and pivot and challenge and rethink and plan for our future businesses. As you saw on the slides, there was 50 of us back in August, and today there's just 11 and only um, nine business ideas out of that. So normally we understand the completion rate is around 25%. And I'm not sure what Benjamin and Paul did to us, but um, they've only managed a 22% completion rate. So um, we, we uh, clearly had it tough, um, I reckon. We've learnt um, about health records, crypto, blockchain, pet seeking, dating apps, building granny flats, energy, energy tracking, um, English books for non-English speakers, and much, much more. And there are all the businesses who are not here today who you're not going to hear from tonight. Um, we, there's many reasons why the 11 of us graduate today, and I'd like to share some common words I would use to describe um, my fellow um, cohort members. I think we're tenacious, we're extremely busy, so we fill our time well. We're determined, we have belief in ourselves and our, our ideas. We're courageous in never giving up. Um, we seek help and we're good at taking feedback. And importantly, we're all willing to help each other to share our experiences and learn from each other. We'd not be here without some amazing knowledge and support from our weekly mentors, sharing all they need, all they can around vision, brand, marketing, and all the other topics you heard Benjamin talk about. And so a huge call out to all those mentors um, to say thank you, because without you, we wouldn't be here. I also want to do a call out to Ryan and Cheryl for their pitch practice and takedowns. Um, pitching is not something that was normal to many of us when we started, but we've come a long way from those first early recordings that we did. Um, I also want to provide a, a huge thank you to Paul and Benjamin, who've kept us on track since the beginning, answering our tedious questions, pointing us in the right direction, and sometimes telling us what we need to hear. And in my case, in week five from Benjamin, that was pull your socks up. Um, and all importantly from Paul, it was if you don't hit the red button, you're not out. So here I am still here um, today. So thanks again to our mentors and to Paul and Benjamin and all to my fellow graduates. Um, I think we um, can all be proud of ourselves in what we've achieved. 
So I've got a one minute pitch and then a very short commitment and reflection. Um, so uh, I will kick off. So Australian organisations waste $70 billion each year in misspent employee benefits and development. I'm Bev Jones and I'm the founder of Benavibe, a digital insights platform that allows organisations to optimise what they spend on people to their unique values and life needs. It tackles the challenge of targeted spending and cost control, enabling quality people and leader conversations and work-life integration. The Benavide product has achieved market fit with a minimum viable product and will run a full pilot um, in the early part of 2023 before a full launch mid next year. It was born at, uh, only 10 weeks ago out of multiple pivots um, in the Founder Institute program. So thank you. So that's my uh, quick pitch. In terms of my commitment, um, my commitment's mainly to my family. Um, I'm a mum of three, 13, 11 and four year old um, children um, and a wife. Um, and I commit to us having our evenings back at least for now and to continuing the plans that we've all committed to for my business um, and for our family um, through to um, the end of um, March, April next year where I'll make a decision on whether I'm going to go gangbusters or not on Benavibe. So that's my commitment. In terms of my reflection, um, my lowest moment, I've already alluded to, it was in week two or three. I got issued with an epic sprint because the ideas that I came in with were rubbish. And Roger Doe um, told me that I didn't have what it took to be a founder. Um, and also that no one's gonna pay for my idea no matter what kind of format it's in. Um, so it wasn't great, um, but in the same week, I pitched to Ryan Cross, who's been nothing but amazing in his support for me um, and Benavibe. He's helped me improve the product idea, um, my pitch, and helped enormous, enormously with my confidence in making this idea a reality. Bev has been so inspiring to me that I'm pitching the same thing. <laughs> um, anyway. Let me get here, because I actually, of course, have slides, because <laughs> I love a slide. Um, and I did want to say, um, you know, kudos to everyone behind Founder Institute, but especially to the wonderful Bev Jones, because she has inspired me to co-found Benavibe with her. Um, she's a wonderful HR leader. The bit she doesn't tell you in her pitch is how great she is with people and also how much she knows about systemizing. Uh, that her worldview. So I'm Alex and Better Vibe is doing exactly what Bev's just told you it's going to do. But the great opportunity is for organisations to better align what they spend on people with those people's unique values and life needs. So I came into FI with a, 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 an insight and data style idea and Bev and I instantly aligned, I think, on values and on this going on this journey together so our pitch is uh that we are going to run this full pilot in early 2023 um and we're definitely looking for some enterprise sales advisors and connections in the hr space if anyone can help us with that so i am going to next move on to my reflection if that is okay um and i have to say in the middle of my reflection i i have felt much more like a baseball player obsessed with something called a pitch than I have um, with anything at any point in my life. Anyone who knows me knows the only sport I play is yoga. <laughs> I do not do team sports well. <laughs> um, so instead of working out how to actually throw or spin a fastball, um, I actually really came to value the power of this short document as a way to distill a business idea. Um, I definitely wished I had a bigger bat to hit a home run with my initial business, um, but the power of Founder Institute is learning that it's okay not to hit a, a home run. In fact, there's an art to understanding the mentors, the networking and the feedback you get in Founder Institute, but an even greater art is the ability to learn from it and shut out the noise a, when it's conflicting and, and B, understand when it's telling you to take a pivot and do something else. So while the feedback hasn't always been easy to hear and it can be more confusing than empowering or pivotal, 
Um, the best feedback has always enabled me to dig deeper and inspired me to take concrete steps to work harder. Um, but even better is the privilege of working more closely with people that I didn't even know however many weeks ago it was when it started because it does feel like 20 months, not, not four. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my reflection on Founder Institute. And I guess my pledge is a little bit more interesting because I've sort of uncovered that building a building a business isn't just about finding something with positive cash flows. It, it, Founder Institute is much more about building something that hasn't been built before and putting a foundation under these things called sandcastles that, um, that we kind of build. So it's exciting and daunting. And my pledge is to use both sides of, of the brain exercises I've been given, the, the, the numerate side of my brain and the creative side of my brain, because FI certainly gave me a lot more business frameworks and practical advice than any of the formal study I've ever undertaken. And certainly any of the executive leadership um, courses that I've done um, through work and corporates. Um, so my biggest pledge is to kill my darlings, which I did, I think, in week eight. <laughs> So it's a skill I learned uh, very early on as a writer, and it's a metaphor for getting rid of unnecessary words and characters and other elements that you've worked really hard to create, but actually need to be removed for the sake of a good story. And I've learned a business idea is the same. You have to remove the ideas that are blocking the success or the growth of it. So you kind of have to murder and interrogate your business idea to make it better and take that bloody potential, shake it off and find the right people and ideas to match it to. So my pledge is to continue committing to find potential through all the interrogations, tools and feedback I've been taught over the last few weeks. So thank you. Thank you, Alex, and um, really inspired by your reflection and your commitment. We now turn to Pedro. Go, Pedro. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm grateful to be here. So thank you all for this opportunity and patience to lead us through this amazing, amazing journey. All right. So let's get started. So my name is Pedro Avila. I'm a fitness coach specialized in injury prevention. But did you know that 90% of the injuries happens at our joints, but mostly do because our joints are under-recovered. And also because as we age, our body slowly loses its ability to naturally heal and recover. But you know what's amazing for joint health? Collagen. Collagen is the most abundant type of protein found in the human body. And we need about 10 grams of collagen per day to help improve joint health. Unfortunately, as we age, we don't produce as much. Therefore, we need to supplement it to maintain our joints healthy. That's why at so Hug is developing the most delicious and clean recovery drink out there. It's a collagen sparkling water designed for all kinds of athletes to improve and to strengthen their joints and muscles, speeding up the recovery, which in turn helps injury prevention. Our lifestyle recovery drink is the healthiest alternative to unhealthy sodas into your conventional tasteless sparkling water. Making Soul Hugger's bold flavor and functional benefits a must-have in all athletes' routines and diets. Oof, I'm thirsty. Ooh, can you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Four months, team. So I'm very proud and excited and happy for this achievement. So thank you for this. Uh, moving on to the next pledge. Um, so I want to begin with a bold statement. So Hug is Limited will become a unicorn in eight years, but since eight years, it's too far away and kind of out there. I want to start my journey by achieving the first step, which is $1 million in revenue in the first 18 months. So then I can finally do what I came here to do, break generational patterns, limiting beliefs, and give a better life to my family back home while having fun and disrupting the fitness wellness industry. I want to use Soul Huggers in my story as an inspiration to help millions of immigrants feel empowered and knowing that everything is possible. As long as you put your mind and heart into it, you can achieve it. And the best, and I'm the living 
proof of it. <laughs> um, I want to talk about my experience and my journey as well. So before, Soho was actually born before I founded the Institute. I had a pretty loose idea of the business. I didn't know what was the actual problem that I was trying to solve and how to communicate. The business had no depth and no real, no real reason why customers should buy our products and also how to survive in the extremely competitive beverage industry, as we all know. Moving forward to four months after, I now have a product. I now have a proper business. It's got meaning. It's got depth. It's been tested and proven during the program. I now have a, a proper business plan laid out. I know what to expect moving forward. And I know how to deal with any adversities the world might throw at us. So huge thanks to all mentors guiding us in this extremely challenging journey. It is an emotional roller coaster, all right. Um, my experience, so Founder Institute was truly transformational. Look, I came to this country, New Zealand, with about $2,000 in my pocket, no network, and with a very broken English. If it wasn't for Founder Institute, I wouldn't know how to deal or even how to speak the investor's language. Now more than ever, I am ready to hit the ground running and take my business to the stratosphere. And as a byproduct, make all investors a lot of money. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I am very, very grateful. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you for those kind words. We're now going to hear from Al Noor. Over to you, Al Noor. Okay, thank you very much, Benjamin. And thank you for all the feedback throughout this journey for us. <laughs> um, so, um, well, I think I'll just uh, give a bit of a problem statement for, for the business, uh, for our business that we're trying to solve. And then I'll just kind of do a bit of a reflection um, of this last uh, three or four months that we have been here. Um, so um, uh, I'm a founder of DowBits, and we strive to make crypto trading more accessible to non-power retail investors by offering them easy to use platform where they can trade like a pro with minimum learning curve. So, you know, when I joined Founders Institute, my journey started not here, but I think my journey started a few years ago, 2018 with Founders Institute when I first met Adio Rashi in, in Silicon Valley, actually, and a trip to the Silicon Valley. And that was, I think, the first moment when we sort of, um, you know, um, directly exposed to his leadership on, um, you know, how he speak. And he speak from heart, right? There is no BS when he talks, um, you know, and, and, and from that, we, we know that you know, when I was uh, joining this Founders Institute program, I know that there are going to be a lot of feedback coming our way and that will be unfiltered, right? You have to really listen it, you need to suck it up, and then you need to go and improve on it. And I think that was the best part, right? So when, when you hear it, often we as a founders work with the team and at, at times you have a blinkers, right? So we hear from people, maybe sometimes we receive information that we wanted to hear, but this is a platform where we hear things where we sometimes don't want to hear. And, and, and that's helped us reflect, you know, go back into introspection that, okay, am I doing it right? Or, or is there maybe somewhere we can make ourselves better, our product better, our offerings better, and eventually our reach, uh, our community a bit better. So I think that's the kind of impact that Founders Institute has. I think it has pretty significant impact on our business. I think regardless of whether we, you know, um, uh, the, the monetary aspects are part, but, but I think that made us kind of a better, more impactful business or at least may help us think in that particular direction. Uh, so I think that, uh, and as, as Benjamin Chong has said in his, uh, uh, you know, in our inaugural speech, um, that. Uh, structure, network, and feedback. This is exactly, I think, the, the value of the Founders Institute, I think for me, really, um, to, to open up and give us a kind of a direction in terms of where we 
go from where we are, how to go and raise capital, for instance, provide right structure, provide right mentoring and provide right feedback for, for that. So, so that is something I think the key things that, that I'll take away. And coming down to the pledge, I would say, uh, we wanna at least help 1000 customers by end of 2024, that's gonna be my pledge. And that's where we're gonna go and move forward from, from here. So a lot of learnings, um, especially around the legal areas that, you know, I wasn't, uh, I have a view that they're gonna be something in, in, in our industry, uh, which is hitting the regulations have been coming. So we be just monitoring those aspects, but I think it, with, with Founder Institute, the assignments and maybe working with the legal firms while after joining Founders Institute, um, I think make us pretty significant progress in in number of fronts and 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 helping to sort of uh, getting close to our launch journey. So thank you very much to all the mentors here uh, for all your feedback, for all your office hours, and all your straight no BS feedbacks. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Good on you, Alna. We're gonna move over to Kabir. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll I'll quickly start with uh, what we are doing at Brick Medics. Uh, so we are creating a resilience platform and you know this is uh, this is again like you know just one of the change that happened during the course uh, of founders institute we started with a, a name called disaster operations management and and you know in in due course i realized that you know that's that's not solving the problem and it's very difficult to make people understand so uh, we've we've changed it to resilience platform and, and this platform is going to help uh, the utility organizations, uh, specifically the electricity utility organizations, uh, to start with in Australia and then hopefully uh, throughout the globe, uh, mitigate and and <clears throat> uh, you know uh, work well uh, during the extreme weather events. Uh, as you know, uh, you know the climate change is is a reality and. Uh, the number of events, uh, they are just going up and uh, by predictions, like by 2050, they're going to double. Uh, they have a significant impact on the services these utility uh, organizations provide to the community, the business, uh, you know, and everyone uh, around us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a central service. And if the electricity is gone, uh, there are, you know, uh, uh, studies that within 10 days, uh, everything comes to a standstill. And it's, it's happened in, in Australia uh, in two, uh, 2016 um, in Adelaide, right? So <clears throat> we're gonna be helping uh, the utility organizations with this uh, resilience platform, uh, plan, prepare during the event and post the event, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the commercial and then the regulatory aspects, and also from a uh, operations perspective so that you know, instead of restoring a power in eight weeks, you can restore power in two weeks. And instead of paying a penalty of, you know, uh, 300, 400 million, you pay penalties of 20, 30 million. So, so that's what, uh, in a nutshell, you know, Grid Medics is uh, planning to achieve. And it's an impact organization, other than the commercial and the technology aspect. Uh, it touches the community as well, right? Uh, communities are without electricity or gas or water for you know, weeks and weeks during these extreme weather events. So <clears throat> that, that's what, uh, you know, Grid Medics is all about and what we are trying to achieve. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, reflect on my journey uh, on FI. So we we incorporated uh, Grid Medics in, you know, say late 2020, uh, early 2021. Um, <clears throat> we've been, I mean, there's, there are like four or five uh, co-founders in Grid Medics, and we all come from the industry. So uh, validating the idea and like, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, getting those kind of validations was not an issue, right? Uh, but there were other kind of challenges because we, we are a bootstrap organization um, and, and four uh, founders, we put in money together and uh, built a pro product, you know, to a prototype level. And the main idea was uh, to raise money, at least, you know, pre-seed or seed kind of money so that we can develop the product, uh, say to an MVP, it's an early stage prototype still, 
to an M MVP level, and then we can go to our customers and you know ask for uh, pilots and so on and so forth, right? And and then uh, we take over from there. And then the second thing was to uh, get like you know one or two good co-founders uh, from a data or like you know local perspective. Now <clears throat> coming to a founders institute in the early weeks itself, right? Uh, I think like it was week two or week three. Um, the whole idea was like, you know, thrown out of the window. Uh, I talked to Paul. Uh, that's the first guy I speak with. And he says like, why do you need money, you know, to build your product, right? I mean, haven't you heard that guy, forgetting that uh, name of the person, he he sold uh, his product based on uh, PPT, right? Uh, don't, don't put money, like validate, like, you know, uh, things uh, improve. Then I, I speak to Ben, I get the same feedback. I speak to Phoebe, I get the same feedback. I would have spoken to like four or five uh, different mentors in period of like two weeks. And uh, the whole, uh, you know, thought process of joining FI changed, right? And here we are today, uh, very advanced uh, in, in discussions with uh, a few of large distributors in Australia. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we should we should get an LOI before the end of the year. And uh, that's 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 the pledge uh, that I want to make to the founders and uh, to my team, the co-founding team, they, they're not here. That at least like, you know, next three months or like uh, Jan, Feb, March, we should have completed one pilot. So that's that's about grid medics and like, you know, my journey and you know what, what we want to do. So thank you. Kabir, congratulations. Thank you for your fine words. And Thanks. over to you, Lenore. So hi, everyone. My name is Lenore, and I'm the founder of Health42. Uh, so healthcare systems worldwide are facing some serious issues with sustainability and cost pressures. The chronic diseases are on the rise. The price of new drugs and even generic drugs is increasing. And patients are, um, fortunately, much more informed, and they expect a lot more. And so pharma companies, as part of this ecosystem, they spend over $5 billion every year on patient support programs uh, as part of their efforts to ensure the commercial success of their drugs, of course, but also in the efforts to ease the burden on healthcare systems. And these programs give doctors the confidence to prescribe, but they also give patients um, the, the support that they need to keep on treatment for longer. Um, however, patient support programs are expensive and bespoke and non-scalable, and to be honest, sometimes a little crappy, and I should know because I've done a few, um, and only a select few drugs will ever have support programs because they are really expensive and they are impossible to sustain throughout the life cycle of the drug, and plus they are really not built for patients or they don't really sometimes have the patient in mind. And so Health42 wants to change all of this, and we want to help pharma companies for now, but then we also want to tackle other uh, markets. Uh, we want to help them in uh, spinning up patient support programs uh, faster and in less cost and less time to market and in a more tech enabled way. Um, we are building basically as a patient experience manager. So it's one platform that launches and hosts multiple support programs that are tailored to each patient and to each drug. And basically what I want is for all drugs and all patients in the world to have access to relevant support programs. My pledge is to uh, have the MVP done uh, and ready for pilot for pilots in the beginning of next year, and have at least one pilot starting by mid February, so I can continue to raise money and uh, hire a team, especially a CTO, so I can stop asking uh, my husband to work for me for free, basically. Um, as for the journey, so Founder Institute has really helped me evolve my business plan and sort of the way, especially the way I pitch, I was really self-conscious at the beginning, I think. Um, and things are now much uh, clearer and a lot more structured. Um, and I know things that I should look out for because of the, because the program is very comprehensive. So some, some things might not apply immediately, but I, I know what to look out, look out for in the future. And, you know, sure, my 12 years of experience in pharma help a lot in building, you know, the business, understanding the problem and the product, but the challenges that I found in this program, and they're really hard questions, 
uh, have been tough, but have been essential. And the access to mentors has been absolutely amazing and not just in Australia. And uh, with Paul's help, I've actually had some amazing conversations with, with uh, mentors in Europe and in Singapore. And so, yeah, the program is really intense, but it's very much worth every single drop of sweat and tears. And I mean, even the cohort has been absolutely amazing and I cannot wait to see everyone's uh, success. So yeah, and a big thank you to Paul and Benjamin for pushing us and to achieving more and improving in every session and to Roger and Samir for all the candid, sometimes hard feedback and to the point feedback and to Ryan for all the patience and extra time and the non-BS <laughs> sort of approach that, you know, stings but it's uh, very much needed. And so, yeah, 10 out of 10, I would do it again. Hi, I'm James from Mint 21. And our vision is to be able to produce games faster and cheaper. Those of you who don't know, developing games is a huge risk due to the fact it costs a ton of money and it can take a really long time for games to be developed. This here is a generalized way of how indie game budget is broken down with the largest single cost nearly always being art. With records of budgets, our budgets being up to 75%. When looking at the game development pipeline from idea to release, you can see that the creation of art assets for games is of a considerable time expense as well. Lately in the media, you might have seen that AI can now surpass the artistic abilities of humans, changing the way art is being produced and used professionally. Our solution is to apply AI art to the game development pipeline, revolutionizing the way games are being developed. So we created Mech AI, which is a suite of AI-driven tools, services, and workflows for streamlining game production. Some features we have right now to achieve our solution include the predicting of popular gaming trends and the creation of unique art, therefore accelerating the generation of game assets. Some features we are adding in the future include uh, the generation of intricate 3D character models with customization options that are fully textured with a set of animations. Now moving on to my pledge. I pledge to develop a service for game developers like myself to help keep their dreams alive by making it increasingly possible for them to make bigger and better games that won't break their bank accounts. Within the next 12 months, I aim to grow the team and capabilities within the company. The next step is to have an improved prototype with more features, filling in all kinds of skill gaps, further extending our effect on the way games are being developed around the world. So before I joined the Founders Institute, I was a guy who just wanted to make a living developing games. And during my time in the program, I was truly tested and pushed to think in ways I had not expected. In turn, this brought on a new way of thinking towards my business and myself as a business owner. Coming out of the program better than when I walked in, leading me to where I am today. I've met some wonderful people along the way who made my time valuable and challenged me to be better and improve myself and my business as a whole. So a big thank you goes out to all who helped me along the way, and I wish all the other graduates the best of luck and a lifetime of success in achieving their visions. Thank you. I'm targeting a sport that's very, very new in Australia. It's uh, taking over the world currently, uh, selling double the amount of rackets in comparison to tennis, and it's got over 25 million players worldwide. So as Benjamin mentioned, I'm an ex-professional tennis player and I'm bringing Rebound Paddle, which will be bringing the world's fastest growing sport to Australia. So currently Australia only has six clubs and they're all operating at 120% capacity and a surplus demand. So what Rebound Paddle is doing is we're bringing state-of-the-art indoor clubs, uh, obviously targeting the weather conditions we've been having all across Australia. Um, and our revenue mainly will be coming from coaching programs, club membership, casual court hire, just like a usual tennis club. Um, but with a little bit of a twist and we'll eventually we'll move into the franchising the model uh, nationwide and focus on the real estate side of things as well. Uh, we're planning to launch our MVP as early as next year uh, to make it the go-to brand in paddle across Australia for equipment information. And this will give us a bit of live data and traction of the growth of the sport here. Uh, we're also in discussions with a sports club um, to redevelop their tennis courts into paddle courts uh, and that's where rebound paddle will start its journey which is extremely exciting uh, i'm the founder of paddle and i've got professional experience in both tennis and paddle 
as well as business development and management. So I'm looking for an advisor to join me on this journey who can offer guidance, mentorship, networking, and more. So now the pledge, um, very structured again, like I said. Uh, so Rebound Paddle, I promise to myself to stay committed on the journey throughout the ups and downs I'll face and the roadblocks that we'll need to get past as we've all faced already. Um, I, I need to, like I'm committing to 60 hours per week at least to get the idea rolling and growing over the next few years. So it will be an exciting journey for myself and any partners who join me. By 2024, uh, we want to launch our own facility turning over $150,000 in revenue and at least 10 employees uh, starting a career in this sport. By late 2025, we want to launch our franchise packages with other partners across the nation and who have a passion for the sport. Um, and this will help us generate revenue through the franchise royalties and offering more jobs, careers and opportunities to people in this new sport. And by 2027, we want to have at least one rebound paddle location every major city in Australia. Uh, so you'll, if you guys see a rebound paddle centre in your late uh, major city, you'll know where it's come from. So you guys are very exciting. It's an exciting journey to go ahead. So reflection, um, I was actually very lucky enough to coach a mentor from FI, Dan Bignold, who introduced me to Founders Institute after I probably spent too much time asking him questions about founding a startup rather than actually coaching him tennis. Uh, so at the time of enrollment, I thought that would have been the, the hardest step was just to get the enrollment. However, man, was I wrong? This has been an incredible journey from reorganizing my whole week schedule uh, and accommodating these weekly sessions the group meetings, finding times for those deliverables in the early hours of the morning and presenting my pitches weekly. It's been a heck of a journey, that's for sure. Uh, I don't think I would have, I'm the only one who's been looking at that dropout button from week one. I'm super thankful to all the founders and group members, despite their hardships, remain positive and supportive to keep each of us pushing through to make it to this last day. And I'm sure we'll keep helping each other as, as our business progress. I've had the experience to uh, pitch to investors, incorporate my company and gain huge traction in the paddle community, which all came through uh, Founders Institute. It's thank you to all the mentors, especially the ones who really uh, worked hard and stepped out of their way to help me out, such as Ryan, Paul, Ben and Chris. Uh, this whole journey and experience has been worthwhile and I'm extremely just excited to see where this takes me. Thank you, guys. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your pitch, your pledge and reflections. We are going to hear from Nagendra. Thanks, Ben. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever rented a house in Australia, then you'd probably know the rental applications are lengthier and, and longer than a home loan application. And that leads to property managers. They spend around eight hours to process applications for just one property. This cost the industry around $1 billion. Hello, my name is Nagendra. I'm founder and CEO of Yohosta. Yohosta uses technology to pre-process all this data that comes as part of the rental applications. And we provide the top ranking applicant to the property manager. And with this help, property managers can find the right tenant eight times faster. My uh, pledge is uh, by end of Q1 next year, I'll have a full-fledged team for product, sales, and marketing. I'm already working full-time on this uh, startup. Uh, in terms of uh, getting customers, I'm planning to get 25 customers, property management agencies by uh, end of Q1 next year, 1,000 renters, and would be generating uh, 30K in monthly revenues. As part of my journey uh, founder inst in Founders Institute, before I joined, I thought I had a very good idea and, and I have kind of built my MVP and I know it's going to work, but that was not true. So the main reason behind that was because whatever I was doing, that was, I was doing only things that I was comfortable doing with like coding and building the product. But after talking to a few mentors and, and attending some sessions in founders uh, in, in FI program, I understood that I have to do more important things like talking to customers, which is not comfortable uh, coming from a technical background. I am I'm very introvert. I don't like going out and talking to people, but I did all these things because those were necessary things. 
and also building financial model is like a scary thing because you you would know whether <laughs> your company will be profitable or it's going to take multiple years to just even uh, break even so building the financial models is one of the those hard things that i did as part of this program i think uh, apart from the weekly sessions and meetings with the found uh, with the mentors and uh, directors of the program uh, our weekly team meetings were uh, very helpful and uh, we were able to discuss and our problems and we were able to kind of get ideas from different people and uh, i think i made some great friends from our working groups and uh, i made some uh, partnerships as well with some of the co-founders after joining fi i think in september i did a pivot in my idea and started targeting property managers and since then i was able to sign up five property management agencies they are currently in their paid trial and i'm targeting to i'm i'm comfortable in getting five more uh, agencies by end of this year thank you again rap thank you and good on you for graduating congratulations and making all of those calls and pounding the pavement well done we are now going to hear from cassandra the problem with the working from home and the hybrid model isn't about productivity it's how does a small business like a marketing agency manage their clients their projects their teams and their expenses yes there's a lot of enterprise solutions out there on the market but they're not designed for small businesses who run mean and lean small businesses are using overlapping and costly software subscriptions they have a lack of expenses tracking and many times they don't really know if they're either over or under serving their clients and that's where can ticket comes in i want to introduce you to Jess and Sarah both of them run a marketing agency with 12 team members on the left Jess just works out on average how much she spends per month to keep her team connected either on a project management solution on time tracking or on a CRM But on the right, meet Sarah. She's smart. She switched to Can Ticket because she understands it's all inclusive as a CRM, a time tracking, a project management suite, and expenses tracking. And she just set them up with an office network. I'd rather be like Sarah. So, what is Can Ticket, and what sets us apart from other players in the industry? Well, first of all, we're not a project management solution. We're a business operations suite. It's one place to keep control of your costs. manage your clients, your projects, your teams, prevent micromanaging. Nobody likes being asked what are you doing today or what did Jimmy do last week? It's one place to streamline your workflow, capture all of your expenses when they come to different tasks and projects, one place to run reports. Our secret sauce is also our account management portal. We've developed a special interface that allows our clients to submit requests directly into a team. It's really hard to recruit for account managers in hybrid and remote teams. And this takes the stress out of small businesses. What does the market look like when it comes to operational software? In Australia, there's 9,000 marketing agencies, and that's who we're targeting at first. But if you look at what the Tech Council have put out, by 2030, there'll be over 1.2 million tech workers in Australia, and then again, growing up by globally. But right now, we're focusing on marketing agencies and web design agencies, and we're going after this portion of the revenue because we understand that this is who. will benefit the most from can ticket. What's our business model look like? We've got three subscription levels and can ticket's already built and functioning at the, at this point in time as well, which I should mention. It's $22 per seat. We're averaging and trying to target organizations with at least 10 staff and we want to hit 3000 subscribers by 2024. And currently can ticket has been bootstrapped. So we've just been growing the platform organically to date. So I understand you're probably sitting here rolling your eyes going There's already so many solutions in the saturated market, but it really isn't. In particular, for small businesses who run mean and lean. Yes, there's other established players in the marketplace, but agencies and marketing businesses are using multiple subscriptions to do one thing. Whereas Can Ticket is one solution, one fee, one login for the small business to operate from. What does our team look like? So we've been eating our own dog food using Can Ticket for the better part of the last three years. It was an internal tool. That's how it started its life, and I've cherry picked four of our team members from Candid Marketing to help build Can Ticket. I myself have run a few different awards at the New South Wales Business Chamber, 
for outstanding entrepreneur and, outstanding, and excellence in micro business in previous years. So I understand small business. I understand these types of solutions. I've been using them myself for the better part of the last 12 years. Our traction to date has been slow and that's fine. We're happy with that. We wanted to make sure our product was fit for purpose for other businesses who are just like us. I've been featured in the financial review and I've also secured 30 paid seats off the signer. And I'm very proud of that. And that agency in particular has staff in Adelaide, Bangladesh and in Sydney, and they're using it across multiple time zones. We've been out of beta for almost a year now, and we've got 133 free users. So what's our go-to-market strategy? We understand the next year is going to be our most interesting year where I'll be diving in and driving this in particular. Things that didn't work for us that we've been trying with some ads, it's just too expensive, but we understand now that we need to talk to decision and non-decision makers alike when it comes to these types of solutions. So what are we asking for? What are we doing? We're looking for seed funding towards the end of summer next year, where we want to grow our platform, mainly targeting in sales and marketing and getting more users and getting people familiar with Can Ticket in general. Thank you very much, Founders Institute, for the opportunity to be involved in this year's accelerator program. As mentioned before, we are privileged to hear from a renowned founder. The founder that I mentioned before has got some scar tissue, but a founder who has demonstrated a great deal of resilience, uh, lovely generosity, but also a desire to make the world a better place. So I'd like to turn over to Liesl. Please, we'd love to hear your perspective after we've heard from all of these founders who have taken part in the most recent Founder Institute program. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. And it's a privilege to be here and well done for starting companies. I, I think sometimes it takes a particular kind of masochism to be a founder entrepreneur, but once you've, once you've tasted it, you just cannot go back. You cannot go back to not creating and shaping your own reality. Um, I thought it might be fun. I'll do a quick little career walkthrough if you wanted, Benjamin, just uh, a couple of slides and tell you what I'm doing now. And then uh, maybe I'll tell you some of the, the things that I've learned along the way about staying on course and, and building something big. Um, so as Benjamin mentioned, I've built a few companies. So my company is called Akin. Akin means to be like something else and to be part of the family. So we're building warm, empathic AI systems that are a big part of your family and that actually think and reason more like people. Um, here's some ancient history for you. Back in 2000, I thought it was a great idea to build a search engine. Um, pretty much everyone I met in Australia said, but didn't you know the internet's dead? You know, we've already got Alta Vista. We don't need more search technology. Uh, stick with something you know. You know, there was a massive tech crash on. Benjamin, you were around in the investment scene then, and there was not many people who believed in the future. And, you know, everyone was, had made their money and sort of putting up shopping malls and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I said stuff that um, I, I thought that the information explosion was happening. Um, people were moving more and more onto the internet. It was a big chaotic mess. So what I did is I, I spent a couple of months of empty space. I'm um, just really thinking about where I thought society was going, where I thought technology was going. I thought we're going to need more search technology. So I, I won a, a tiny federal government grant, $273,000, which I thought was a huge amount of money. It pretty much was in 2001 because there was no money anywhere on the planet going to tech. Um, and with that small amount in 300,000 matching, um, I actually built and launched a search engine. We had about 6 million users using it. We were actually cracking along. Um, we got a couple of media articles. It was still print media back then. Um, here's, here was sort of the, the, the highlight of the direct-to-consumer search. This was an MIT tech article. And you can see there is Google, there's uh, Alta Vista, and there's Muta. Um, and yeah, we were, we were corking it. I remember going to a meeting at Google. Um, they were still in the original building with the lava lamps. And they had this tiny quadrant. Um, they had hired the, the chefs from the Grateful Dead that stolen them away from the band. And the, the quadrant was just flattened. There was no grass, it was just mud from the enormous amount of people that had to hire very quickly. And I walked into the first meeting, there was the head of MA and a whole bunch of people around standing around the wall taking notes. And they said, we're not signing any NDAs. And it was crazy times, it was wonderful. Um, Google had raised about 23 million in venture funding. 
Um, so it's a bit hard to compete with 200,000. Um, they also are basically through a series of very sophisticated moves by having very good venture backing, got themselves an extremely good CEO, brilliant um, head of business development who landed them on AOL's homepage. Um, and that was it. So everyone thinks Google grew organically. They didn't. Um, they actually got a, a partnership agreement where, you know, back then everyone used to open up AOL and there was search and one day they opened it up and it was powered by Google. People go, well, like AOL was the internet for most people. It's like the internet. And then there's this powered by Google. I mean, what's that? They were gone. That was the end of AOL and the growth of Google. They also stole pay-per-click from Yahoo um, and Yahoo sued them. And that was a whole fun, fun times. Anyway, so once they got funded and started growing, I decided to turn this into a platform. We were a pretty good engine. We were actually able to uh, infer kind of who you were as a human being from the way you search, not just your keywords. So it was really important as mobile was growing um, in, uh, you know, non-American countries, all of APAC. So I had to deal with Baidu, which no one knew who they were at the time and, and so on. And that company ended up going public on the ASX. Um, I left about the time it went public. The, the new um, guard, I was quite diluted and the new guard were really not investing in technology. And this was a very competitive tech feel like you know a 0.1% click through rate really mattered so um i decided i would go build something bigger and i did so um it was a great outcome for the the investors um um the company didn't do as well after i left but i, I do think that, that the tech investment does have a lot to do with that you can't start out with a core mission and shift it too much um then i decided to build an ai company I fast forward 8 years later Yay, we got acquired by IBM. Oh my God, what an eight years that was. Um, again, I, I started with the federal government grants, the, a bit of a bigger one this time, 1.5 million. Um, I, again, I started out by thinking before I jump into the next thing, I was going to build another search company. So no, let me just step back. Let me give myself some space. Let me go speak to people like Benjamin and mentors and go to conferences and just listen to what people think is coming next because I'm so in in the guts of the car with grease up to my elbows, you know, and I, I decided that, um, you know, this hyper personalization trend was coming, human population continuing to explode. We all need to feel really special, uh, but there's too many of us. So I thought AI, it's coming. Uh, this was like 2005. So again, everyone said, but didn't you know, there's an AI winter and AI is dead. And um, yeah, there we go. Um, so some of the, the, the backstory then, we, we got a grant, we, we were trying to build a one-click AI where you could go, here's a big pile of data, here's your job in life, here's what you look like, go. We never quite got to one-click, but um, we, we by the end of eight years, we could build an enterprise-grade AI system inside 12 hours, flat, De demo version, and direct to public inside three months, which was crazy, crazy efficient. Um, so yeah, uh, the first big breakthrough for us, we'd built this platform. We were running social bots um, and we, we decided to launch it on social media, on MySpace. Um, and Michael Arrington at TechCrunch wrote a story. And I can't tell you what this did for us. Um, we, we had a, a base persona called the Evil Twin and he, he built one in like an hour. And we were smashed with traffic, like systems down, you know, a million chats it was glorious. Uh, we broke, we fixed everything again, but we got so much data. It was beautiful. Um, we had people putting up their bots online, pretending to be themselves. It was really, really good fun. This is pre-Siri. You know, nowadays we all go, hey, Siri, or hey, Google, or, you know, Google Maps, you talk to it. These, this was not the thing that like I don't know if you can even remember that far back but everyone thought I was crazy um and then 2008 hit those of you who were trying to do anything in 2008 tech related or raise capital in 2008 was a rough time um so we had to then focus on where it was money and I'll, I'll talk to you in a minute about valuation drivers just stop me because I'll talk all night okay so I'll, I'll try I'll try wrap in 10 minutes so we can have questions so this was the very first um, you know, nowadays you'll go to your, your apps and there'll, there'll be a Chiba button, a Kia button, an ATO bot. This was the very first one in the world to go live on a bank anywhere. And it was a My Cyber Twin. There's our URL. We were called My Cyber Twin because we, we wanted it to be a twin, but we rebranded to Cognia. And this was National Australia Bank. Um, we They were terrified that people would say, oh, it's a robot. So they put a human face up there, which we advised them against. Um, and people didn't know. It was really interesting. It passed the Turing test. 
it's not that hard. I mean, it's hard, but you know, it's doable. Um, and then we we said, look, let's just be authentic. And they then put up Nola, and she started out just on credit cards and ended up doing everything: frontline customer support, email, phone triage across all channels. Um, and integrating with a back-end CRM system. We were doing a lot of analytics as well. So it wasn't just conversation systems, but you had this raw data, this flood of humans going, I hate the colors. I don't like this. Why can't I do this? You know, if I do this, then that. So we were really getting this very qualitative um, feedback. Um, and then we, we were, I believe, the first in the world to do mobile-enabled conversation agents that hooked into all sorts of systems like mapping and so on. This is a standard charted one. Um, these to, to be any good, you know, they had to be quite aware of human state. Um, and then I'll, in the end, I actually moved to San Francisco after Siri launched, everything changed. I was still undercapitalized. Um, you know, there was not a lot of money in Australia for this kind of thing back then. There was um, not, not a lot of deep tech investors. So um, I just won State Farm, which was the second biggest insurance company in the US and Geico. So two of the three biggest. We were actually doing Apple's help desk, but we were never allowed to talk about that. Um, I shouldn't be talking about it now. Either, you know, it's a long time ago. Um, and HP was distributing and using that picture and stopped laughing. No one's, oh, shit, you're recording. Okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> um, I should stop the swears. I'm having fun. Um, and then basically we got a knock on our door. Um, I was in San Francisco. We were doing a, a, a hackathon weekend um, for a big health insurance company and IBM wasn't just a random knock though. Um, I'll tell you the, the backstory in a minute. And this is one of the key things. You know, customers are not people that you, they're not there to get money from. They're there to love. I'm just going to pause and let that sink in. Like we do this work because we love what we're doing. We love the technology we're building and we love the people we serve. There's that old um, line from Jerry Maguire. Remember that movie? where his mentor, the salesman, said to sell anybody, you've got to love. And, and that's true. IBM ended up happening. Um, IBM is a very honorable company. They have in, enormous integrity and they, um, you know, they, they've kind of faded into enterprise land, but they're, they're a, uh, just a wonderful company to be part of. But here's my founding story. And I worked for IBM for two years and I kept being bothered. And I'll tell you why I was bothered. Every time we did a, an AI system, whether it was a simple one or a complex one, we were seeing significant behavioral change across large populations. If a bank said to us in the middle of a financial crisis, we want our customers to have more debt, we would double the take up of debt. If um, a company said we want to sell more product, random shit that people don't necessarily need, but we want them to have, we would double. Typically, it was 15 to 200 percent uplift on any metric reducing call center costs selling more product first call resolution rate whatever now you can only do this with a combination of very very um you know rigorous analytics on the back end with hundreds of state variables and and a good human level interactive ai but i looked at this and i thought what kind of world are we going to build um you know are we going to build a world where these things start moving into our homes and our kitchens are they going to decide what we're having for dinner are they going to, you know, decide what TV show I'm watching? Are they going to know where I'm going and who I see when I get there? And what is the intention? These are persuasive systems. They know everything about you. And they wrapped up like humans. And we are wired, like at a primate level in the cave, scratching each other's fleas to respond to something that's anthropomorphic. And I thought we could well end up in a, a situation where these systems are making more than half of our daily decisions without us even realizing it and being about a third of our relationship time based on what I saw, like, you know, with companion characters that we built. And what is the intent? AI optimize for what you tell them to optimize for. And that was the, the founding idea behind Akin. I wanted to do... Basically, this core idea is about a more responsible co-evolution of technology and humanity. I truly believe that we had the Donald Trump era because AI algorithms optimized for newsfeed that fed your biases. I've no doubt about that. I used to work in social media. They asked us to build a Cambridge Analytica and I said no. Um, and they offered us a lot of money to do it. 
you know, um, so someone else did it. Um, you know, I, I have no doubt that that the the current NUI we have with the world, that our body mass index, that the the fact that Americans spend more on takeaway than they do on groceries that they cook at home today, is from AI powered systems. Um, we think we are all very private and we won't let AI run our lives. But if you use maps to go somewhere, you're using AI. If you use autocomplete in your emails, you're using AI. If you bought anything online, anything you're using AI. If you looked at suggested movies, you're using AI. And if you put this thing down and you lose it and you feel uncomfortable, this is like an extrapolation of self and it's AI powered. So what I wanted to build is this world where we have an AI that thinks and feels more like humans, more conscious of like we are, um, but that also we as a species get better because we use this technology. So that was the vision. I thought what would happen, I was in San Francisco, I was top of my game, just been acquired by IBM. I, I think I, I pitched you about that time, Benji, I was going, like, I'm going to get $100 million in San Francisco, you know. Um, I didn't get $100 million, uh, but we, we got a couple of million. Um, and it was a bit, it was quite abstract, like this is quite a, a sort of social impact. We never, you know, like if we had a choice between doing something good in your life and having a transaction, we'll say, let's go for a walk let's not buy a movie, let's go for a walk. And so there wasn't a transaction thing. It was like, a, we're going to make the world truly better. Um, so it was, it was quite hard um, to raise. Well, but we raised enough to get going and we found our commercial beachhead, which is great. So let me just fast forward because we're going to run out of time. So this was just some of the data I've told you about. So really that we, we spent about two or three years working on a novel approach to AI. Most AI systems today are basically a hybrid of machine learning and rules engine. So machine learning can classify data it can learn, but it doesn't reason. Rules engines are from the 50s, and they basically impose these sort of statements like if this, then that, and they're like a traffic manager for AI systems. So whether it's an autonomous car or an Alexa, they're mostly using these hybrid systems, and they're very input-output focused. What is the problem I'm solving? How do I get from A to Z? You know, someone says, what's the weather? I'll tell them the weather. Humans don't rock like that. If my husband calls from downstairs and says, hey, what, is a, what does an AI do with that? But I know that he's going, hey, because it's bath time. And, um, you know, he's forgotten what's for dinner again. And um, he's just been to the beach. So he's pretty happy. So he's not unhappy. Now, I'm using that hey and his inflection as a clue to what we think of as a river of state at a kin. So your very core of your rivers is your persona, your values, your emotions, which are discernible. And then humans run these hypotheses engines, you know, we, we're basically triaging towards a given state. So something like I want pizza or, you know, what's the weather? That's not the thing. The thing is, what's that telling us about my event trajectory through life and the people around me and their trajectory and how we trying to kind of nudge and bump each other on this river of life to get to a given endpoint with a given state matrix. So we basically built a chaos-based AI system. We're still in the lab because we're too scared to take it out. We don't have enough funding to put it live in the real world because it might um, do stuff. Um, but we, we've, we've basically built it and it's, it's the most interesting thing I've built. Um, what we've done though, is um, we've started working on our problem space. So about four, uh, four years in, investors start going, well, come on now, Liesl, you have to come up with an application. But I'm doing science. No, you have to do an application. Um, so I said, look, I'm going to apply it to the problem space that's, that I've wanted to solve my entire life. Um, and this is Jenny. Uh, Jenny is a caregiver. She represents one in three human beings. Um, now, this is one of my favorite graphs. Someone did a PhD. They constructed the labor cost to run a home. We've not really thought about the home as a workplace, but it is. It's actually 40% of GDP, the unpaid labor to run the home. It is the biggest unsolved problem space. We're building these enterprise-grade AI systems that can get your pizza to you one second faster, but someone's still lugging around a 25-hour workload just to keep your home going. It's crazy. So this was around beginning of the century, grandma. Here's World War II, you know, when women went to factories, went stuff it. Um, and this was a really interesting time because we actually built robots and brought them into the home. Vacuum cleaners, dishwashers, washing machines are an intelligent combination of thinking and, and automation that took away labor. So I think of them as a kind of a, a static robot. Um, and they gave um, caregivers this huge time bonus. And what did we do with this? Well, women primarily went out to work. We now, uh, millennials have a 72% of 
um, uh, parents or actually working parents if you're millennials, huge, huge. But in the last decade, this care, this load has gone up again. And that's because one in 10 people now has a disability severe enough that they need someone's help to get through the day. So it could be that they're getting old and they've forgotten their doctor's appointment. Or maybe they're a kid, doesn't matter. It's falling on uh, Jenny. So this is the problem we're solving. Um, this is another way to look at this data. This is the uh, US Department of Labor time use survey. It's fascinating data. They've unpacked, they actually survey how people spend their time. They've taken out sleeping, um, but you can see we spend a lot more time doing TV, leisure and sports than actually working, which is quite interesting. Um, but basically this big messy area here is where that 25 hours a week goes. So that's our aim at Akin. We've only started, like we only like, knocking off like 10 to 15 minutes a day um, but the goal is to basically reduce the caregiver weight by literally five to ten hours a week and to do it in a way that a parent would or a mom or a primary caregiver would to make the family healthier and happier so you can see it's a life work this is not something i'm going to finish tomorrow um, it's going to end up being a multi-billion dollar public listed company that's also social impact and that to me is the biggest fun i'm having here can you do both yes you can um, so um, this was our first paid deployment. We, we built a system. I thought, why not do something really um, technically challenging to prove out the tech? So we built a, a system for um, NASA, which we constructed to be very strong metaphors for what we think will be needed in every home. So there's a habitat manager that NASA called Pell. Um, there's physical health robots and there's a little inspector guy who um, does useful stuff. Um, and interestingly enough, we've been able to take this technology and transfer it to Earth. So this is the um, this is not in the ISS. It's actually in the clean room, um, the, the Jet Propulsion Lab clean room. Um, this is a, a simulation, but this is PAL. And we've taken the same core platform and technology, and we've built these embodiments for the home. Now, this little guy is still um, bits and pieces on, on our, our desktops at the moment. It gets assembled and disassembled, but this is live and in production and um, out there now. now. I had a bit of an epiphany um, around business model. You know, I really wanted this to be a subscription model because I don't want to be motivated by transactions, um, but no one's going to, you know, people wanted subscription to be 10 bucks a month and we have a lot of expensive tech development to do. So I was thinking about two years ago, like who gives us stuff? that it costs 25 hours a week to run home. Like no one seems to care. And I realized, oh my goodness, the NDIS cares. So effectively the National Disability Insurance Scheme has gone, well, hey, one in 10 human beings really needs help. They want to have independence and choice. They want to live a life of well-being and social connection. And why should some big charity organization be telling them how to do that? Let's give the money to the end user so they can spend it to stay happy and healthy in their home. So that's basically our commercial beachhead. It's a beautiful, beautiful Venn diagram of most social impact that we can possibly do. Um, a pretty robust revenue model because we're, we're helping people have independence and choice, but also, um, you know, we're actually quite cost effective compared to an $80 an hour human who might turn up and open your fridge and say, oh my gosh, we have no vegetables, let's get takeaway. Um, so we, we basically have a home manager that helps with calendaring and tasks and meal planning and contacts. And the idea is one day we're going to fuse this brain with robots and it'll do everything and I will do nothing except my work which I love and playing with my kids and maybe painting <laughs> um okay uh I won't get too much into this um and we're a public benefit corporation just to make life even more interesting um so there we go um how much time uh Paul and Benjamin would you like me to spend because I can talk about some of my processes around building companies if you like I'd say, look, that was fascinating and it was so wonderful to go through the bit of a survey of what you've been up to during your professional career. And yes, I do remember some of those very early days of the, the search engines and the search engine wars. We've got a number of founders here on the call tonight. Those who are graduating and some who were thinking of taking part in the program. What would you say would be the one or two bits of advice that you would give to people who are on the relatively early stages of the journey? There's obviously been a bunch of feedback so far and there's been all sorts of advice to do this or do that. But then 
there is the point of getting on that bicycle and riding it with enough momentum so that you can stay in a straight line, but also keeping your wherewithal to negotiate the bends and the bumps. Is there advice that you would give your younger self or that you would give those that are on the earlier stages of the founder journey? Um, those are two different questions. So the advice I give my younger self is don't marry that guy. We've had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a much, much better husband. He's a keeper. Um, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, no, but look, the, the advice I would give as an entrepreneur, I, I take um, my, my vision board and, and, and visualization very, very seriously when I don't. Um, things slump and I get, you know, I find myself burned out and getting caught in the weeds and not doing big stuff. So what I, what I do is a process where I really, you know, in that three or four months where I really think about what it is that I'm going to do, this is not something that you're going to build in two years and flip. It just, I always thought of when I started, it never happens. This is 10 years of your life. Okay. And mm -hmm. it's got to be something that you leap out of bed and want to do it. So what, what I do is I set up a, a vision board and I really think about what do I want my life to look like? And this is not just, you know, a big house with, you know, waterfront and all that, but what I want it to feel like, what I want it to look like, what I want my daily life to be like. I also think about my company. I don't think about specific product lines. I think about like, what's the big problem space it's going to be in and how big is it going to be? So like this one I know is going to be about $4 billion. It's going to be NASDAQ listed. I might do a dual ASX on the way. Um, and the reason I know it's going to be big, and I then work backwards. So I know we're going to be in 100 million homes. I know we're going to shift people's state by 15%. They're going to eat more vegetables and go for more walks with their dogs and, you know, and just generally be happier. Um, and that you, you, you construct this mountain. Like not, it's not just a lot of little hills and roads that you're building. So I take this, I, I think about what I want my life to be like. I think about what I want the company to be like, like very tangibly. And then I also think about, um, you know, other sort of less tangible things, like maybe there's a, a, a social altruist in you or someone who wants to do ultra marathons or something. You know, you've got to give that that part of yourself space as well. And then, and then I, I commit to the emotional commitment of that being real. Now, this and is how often. How often, Liesl, do you check in on that vision? When board? I'm when I'm cracking it, it's every morning, every night meditation, and every hour, okay? And oh, then, wow, and then, okay. So this yeah. is not something that you just do, like some people have a quarterly plan and check in mm -mm, once, mm -mm, uh, mm -mm. once I, I a have month. A, I actually made a video on Canva that's on my desktop. I play it every morning. Um, and when I don't do this, you know, it, when I let it slip, then a month or two later, I go, like, what, how did I just spend the last week? I've been running around like a mad took with my head cut off and like nothing happened and I go oh, I've lost my way um the other you know so the the, the the key thing though it's it's not just you know, most of us have grown up with a paradigm where your mum or your dad or whatever whoever brought you up is going you know you've got to get a good degree and then you've got to get a good job and then you know and then you can do this and oh you know stick with what you know or you know uh, in my case, I had a very religious upbringing, so it was, you know, wealth is kind of evil, you know, and um, and you have all of these penny-pinching kind of small thinking grooves in your brain, and the only way to override them is by this, this creative visualization. Now, when I first started doing I this, I did this for my, my education franchise I ran in Africa. Um, I, I decided I wanted to emigrate to Australia, which was absolutely impossible at the time. And um, I decided I needed $100,000. And I walked into the country two years later with about half a million. And that, that meant a lot in the late 90s. And I built this education franchise. I, I, I backward chained. I went, I have to have, you know, like 30 franchises um, inside of two years. And I had 38. Um, and I, I just, I had this, this, this vision board up and I had, I had it stuck on my wall, like pictures everywhere. And at first, I thought it was some magic woo-woo stuff. Like, and, and then I worked it right back. Like, I have to open next month with 30 customers. And then I have to have, like, three franchises a quarter. And I just believed it. And that's the thing. We train ourselves to go, oh, but maybe, oh, but what if, but so-and-so said this, you know, blah, 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 blah. 
and and the thing that happens i think what we do when as entrepreneurs is is what um there's something we call in psychology cognitive dissonance we hate it when there's an imbalance between what's in our heads and the outside world so the way i think about this is this if you know someone who's like very down and the world's terrible and my boss never gives me good contracts and my husband doesn't do this blah, blah, blah. if they won the lottery Four years later, they'd be broke again because there's a dissonance between what's in their head and what's going on. Someone like Alan Bond, I bet when he was in jail, it's like, I'm temporarily can't get out of here, but when I am, I'm rich because he, he was rich in his head all the time. So we have this enormous unconscious brain. And when you create the state of reality and you believe it's real, like you walk, you wake up in the morning and you're waking up in that house you're going to live in in five years' time, you know, you're waking up mentally in this life that you, you're constructing. You, you, you also wake up and go, oh, I haven't spoken to Benjamin for a while. I better contact him. Or, hey, maybe if I did this to the code, this will happen. Or, you know, so you, you're actually harnessing the power of your unconscious because your brain doesn't like that your outside world doesn't match what's in your head. So you actually reconstruct outside reality to match your vision. Um, I don't read a lot of popular literature, but um, the Steve Jobs biography talks about this a lot. I called it, I, I thought I was being awfully clever, but it's kind of, you know, quite quite a well-trodden path. So um, they talk about his reality distortion field where he had in his head that something was going to happen and he just believed it enough and then enough other people did. And it's a fascinating thing to watch. Uh, you know, it really, it really did my head in for a while because I wanted to understand the science behind it. And then I thought it, it's, it's cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, and in this line, you know, the most precious thing we have is our time and our life energy. Money is infinitely abundant, if you can think of it that way. Code is infinitely abundant. Skill is infinitely abundant. But your time and your energy as an entrepreneur is the most precious thing you have. So you have to spend that wisely. So what I was saying about building a mountain, I think about how big this company is going to be. And maybe there's a product line that's not working. It's not a pivot. I'm just dropping a product line could be an entire division but you know i'll drop that because we, we're reaching this mountain this mountain is where the company is going to be and the shape of what it's going to do in the world um i then also do i don't do a classic business plan so i do what i call valuation drivers um with my um, ai company i had a co-founder a fantastic guy john zakos and we spent a week and we did the classic mind mapping and whiteboards and what are our valuation drivers now by this i mean what are the pivotal things like a fulcrum, you know, that if you do this, you're going to create value in the world with what you're doing. And you, once you've got those nailed, you orient all of your decisions around them. So mm. I'll give you an example. I had a brilliant mentor. He ran um, AVG virus software. It's a billion dollar company. He bought it when it was a $4 million company and he listed it a couple of years later at 1 billion. And he started talking about valuation drivers. Oh, that's my loan. So, and valuation, his valuation drivers for AVG, now there's virus software everywhere, but they were one of the first that got really big, really fast, mm -hmm. was get customers, keep customers, monetize customers. So they, he dumped their entire enterprise division and his board nearly sacked him, but he said like, that's, that's not going to help us get customers or keep customers. So they get, they were the first to give away virus software for free. Um, so with Cognia, we, um, my cyber twin, AKA Cognia, you know, the valuation drivers we came up with were uh, defensible AI. AI was in its new spring, or we thought it was in spring, everyone else thought it was still in winter. Defensible technology, something that's truly unique and, and crash hard. Uh, mass uptake and fixed problems. Um, and what yeah. that allowed us to do is as the market changed around us, we, we weren't pivoting, we were just kind of leaning on the other heel. Or the other heel or that. And then if things came across my desktop, I'd go, does that either fix problems, mass uptake, or defense? Well, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So, you know, banking was a natural sector for us to go into post. Well, then we decided we better, we, we were doing mass uptakes. So we were in social media. We had like millions and millions and millions of people chatting to companion bots. 2008 came, well, we, it's fixed problems. We can do human level chat. Who cares? Banks, um, $18 a chat. Um, they were spending at call centers. Um, <laughs> You know, we were like 18 cents. Um, it was quite fun. Uh, and I actually outperformed humans. So we were fixing problems. Um, and banks also gave us the volume that I wanted. You know, I didn't want to do, like someone would come and say, hey, I want to build a bot for my obscure, you know, indie movie. And I got that super interesting. Um, but, you know, mass uptake. Sorry, dude. Um, 
So it allowed us to focus a lot. Um, and then ultimately the defensible AI got us acquired. Um, Please all. Yeah. Please all, thank you so much. I, I, I'm so motivated after hearing you and getting the, getting the vision board. In fact, checking out the vision board very regularly and then also being able to think about the value drivers and spending time with the people that you closely collaborate with to get those value drivers. Appreciate your time. You've been an inspiration to me. I think you've been an inspiration by the smiles and the nods to many of those who are on the call today. It's been sublime. Thank you very much. There's one quick question that a mentor has. If you, if you don't mind, Liesl, and that is, how do you know that you've got the right levers? Because you mentioned the right levers for AVG and you mentioned the levers for Cognia. How do you know if you're thinking of these value levers for your business that you have those right levers? Do you test them on other people or is it, is it, is it somehow a virtuous? It's, it's it's a thought experiment. And the thing is, you've got to give time to it. And we entrepreneurs never have time. It's got a patent to write and pictures to do. And you have to give time. And then what I ask myself is, if I did this, could I impact a billion lives? And I learned that at Singularity University. I was mentoring there. And that, that was the thing. You know, yeah, you wake yeah. up in the morning and is what I'm doing, does it have the capacity to touch a billion lives? And then you write, and then you believe it. Now, the thing with this bigger picture stuff is that you, none of my companies ended up with exactly the product I thought we were going to have when we started out. None of them. You know, five years later, they were different. Um, but mm. we reached that space in the ecosystem that I thought we were going to. And those valuation drivers have been largely accomplished. And this is not just about the company valuation. This is like, are we adding value to the people mm. we serve? Is our technology pushing the state of the art forward? Is there some that that that's what I mean by it? And and if if you think about that more than, oh, the last investor said if I did this, my valuation would be up five million. I'm going to spend the next three months doing that. You will waste ten or fifteen. Yes, three months. Lots cycle. of cycles. How many cycles have have I heard founders wasting because someone so investor told them, oh, do this and then we'll invest. It's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Look, I recognize that it is time. I want to give you a, a vote of thanks on behalf of everyone, Liesl. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving us a very memorable and motivating, inspirational keynote.